I thought that it was fairly common knowledge in the Hellenic polytheist community that human blood sacrifices, including the full-blown ending of human life, are not an acceptable practice in Hellenism, nor were they in antiquity. Recently, a number of folks on TikTok have claimed that the gift of human blood to the Theoi, though maybe not human lives, is an appropriate offering, so apparently not. I have already done an entire video on Miasma Nagos, and murder certainly fits into the latter category with human blood belonging in the former. So let's get deeper into how and why we know that's the case, because a reading of myth summaries clearly has misled a number of people on the ancient views on such things. Got a day. Human sacrifice is a messy topic, even in ancient times. We have a number of myths in which it was regarded with disdain, even when the people in said myths believed it was directly ordered by the gods. We also have a number of historians and commentators who believe that it may have been practiced either in antiquity or in lands they hadn't visited, but talked about it with a note of disgust and distaste that was palpable in their writings. It's pretty obvious when reading tragedy, hymns, and the commentary of ancient philosophers that human sacrifice and human blood were considered polluted, polluted and anhosion, or impious in a way that divides themis, that which is natural and correct. But because the topic keeps rearing its head in the community instead of naming and shaming individuals, I'd like to take a deeper look into how we can come to those conclusions using scholarship and primary sources to help folks who run into others misleading people discuss their claims on a historical basis more effectively. Human blood offerings are risky and potentially harmful outside of theology to begin with, as infections and other nasty complications can can result if they're not performed with care, I would personally discourage anyone not from a living tradition that has explicitly defined reasons and rituals surrounding such things from ever attempting them regardless of the ancient attitudes found in the Hellenic tradition. When I first set out to do this video, I meant to cover the four major evidential categories that we have from antiquity regarding the views that ancient Greeks had on human sacrifice, mythical depictions, historical accounts from the historians of antiquity, the archaeological evidence, or lack thereof, and ritual laws as well as treatises on health and gynecology. Ecology. However, as I worked on the first section on myth, it became clear that there were so many varying kinds of examples that I couldn't possibly give them all a proper treatment in a single video. So as per usual, welcome to another multi-part project that I'm going to do my best to see all the way through from start to finish over the next couple months. I don't often mention my Patreon anywhere other than the end, but for this series, I've got a few very expensive monographs that I need to pick up, and if you'd like to help out with that, link is in the description to my Patreon, Ko-Fi for one-time donations, and the wish list if you'd like to help more directly. Times are hard right now and moving to long form has cut my monthly income literally in half, so if you've got a bit of extra to spare and would like to support the series as I make it, I would really appreciate the help. No pressure if you don't, though. Take care of yourself first, always. That said, from a mythical point of view, let's take a look at the evidence we have as to what attitude the ancients might have taken toward human sacrifice. This video will be divided into two parts. The first takes a look at mythic examples associated with funerary rites and the origins of cultic practices and festivals, including the ever-contentious funerary rites of Patroclus in the Iliad. The second concerns the fall of the House of Atreus, a series of interlinked mythic stories documented by many a different authors ranging from the Archaic to the Hellenistic era, which begins with the fall of Tantalos and ends with the redemption of Orestes. Needless to say, any YouTube video like this cannot be exhaustive but I'm going to attempt to select examples that illustrate the prevailing trends in Greek and scholarly thought. My hope is that by the end, you won't understand only that human sacrifice and human blood offerings were viewed with a general negative light, but how we know so as well. Keep in mind, the next couple of parts are going to be very essential for that because we have more than just mythic evidence. So without further ado, part one, funerals and festivals. The majority of the myths cited outside the fall of the House of Atreus concern supposedly funerary sacrifices or myths that concern the origins of festival rites as viewed by ancient historians. We'll start with the funeral of Patroclus in the Iliad, as it's among the examples most frequently cited by folks trying to defend human sacrifice as an ancient Greek custom. To start, it's important to note that the slaying of 12 Trojans is the only mention of supposed human sacrifice anywhere in Homer, so far as his works survive into the modern day, which makes the scenes related to this both unique and worthy of deep scrutiny. The first mention is in Book 18, when Achilles, enraged at Patroclus' death, swears to avenge him. But now, Patroclus, seeing I shall, after thee pass beneath the earth, I will not give thee burial till I have brought hither the armor and the head of Hector, the slayer of thee, the great soul, and of twelve glorious sons of the Trojans will I cut the throats before thy pyre in my wrath at thy slaying. 
Until then, beside the beaks ships shall thou lie, even as thou art, and round about thee shall deep wooden Trojan and Dardanian women make lament day and night with the shedding of tears, even they that we twain got us through toil by our might and our long spears, when we wasted rich cities of mortal men. After he gets his new armor and returns to the battlefield, in Book 21, he selects the 12 men he plans on sacrificing mid-battle on the river with rage, binding them, and then returning to the slaughter. And he, when his hands grew weary of slaying, chose 12 youths alive from the river as a blood price for dead Praterklos, son of Minotius. These he led forth dazed like fawns, and bound their hands behind them with shapely thongs, which they themselves wore about their pliant tunics, and gave them to his comrades to lead to the hollow ships. Then he himself sprang back again, fully eager to slay. No, not those kinds of thongs. Get your hat out of the gutter, you fucking perverts. In book 23, the deed is finally done, with sheep, pigs, goats, dogs, and horses all sacrificed for the funerary pyre of Patroclos, his body wrapped in the fat of sheep and set ablaze. He brags, just before doing this, about fulfilling the oath that he made in his rage back in book 18. Hail, I bid thee, O Patroclos, even in the house of Hades, for I, even now, am bringing to fulfillment all that aforetime I promised thee, that I would drag Hector hither and give him unto raw dogs to devour, and of the twelve glorious sons of the Trojans, I would cut the throats before thy pyre in my wrath at thy slaying. Notice the mention of wrath here a second time? It's mentioned a third time after the actual funerary rites are performed and Iris set off to go deliver Achilles' prayers to the Animoi to ensure enough wind to fan the flames of the funerary pyre while Achilles grieves. The initial impulse that this seeming sacrifice is an act of irrational anger is dampened a bit by the scene in Book 21 where he selects the Trojans to be killed at the funeral. He literally stops mid-battle, selects the Twelve, then gleefully goes back to his slaughter. This seemingly calm selection to fulfill his oath belies a ritual motive of some kind, albeit not, as we'll see, to sacrifice these people to Patroclus or the underworld gods. Well, some pre-90s scholars suggested that these lines in Homer preserve some custom he's lost sight of from the Greek Dark Ages and thus leave the ritual killings unexplained by him, but rife for examination by modern historians. Dennis D. Hughes, in his monograph, Human Sacrifice in Ancient Greeks, offers a much more plausible explanation given the other evidence we have from Greek cult and other Greek myths. Namely, that this ritualized killing by Achilles combines two differing funerary rituals into one, funerary revenge killing and the actual funerary rights themselves. Back in my video on Greek ancestor and death rights, I mentioned the laws passed by Solon that regulated funerary dirges and forbade women from singing them and bringing their funerary processions through populated areas where the family members might get riled up. This is due to the ancient practice of revenge killing that often took place before the sacrifices were given in the funerary pyre heaped and lit, or a punishment of murderers that would take place in the site of the tomb of the murdered person. This escalated to a crisis level in Athens between 630 and 620 BCE, when an unsuccessful coup escalated into years of reciprocal violence and pollution between two ruling families. Seaford in Reciprocity and Ritual speculates that this historical event may have inspired the scenes we'll talk about in part two from the Oresteia, where Athena appoints the court the rule of justice to remove vengeance as a way of seeking it, i.e. the pacification of the Furies, and as ultimately the courts banished one of the families at the end of this bloody conflict, even going so far as to cast the bones of their buried dead out of the city, which thereby created the same victory for the courts of Athens over the vengeance models of the families that we saw with Apollon, Orestes, and the Furies in the Oresteia. We'll go over that again more in part two. Reciprocity, both positive and negative, formed the backbone of ancient Greek society, and this included revenge when a family felt that their own had been done wrong. Funerary laments were often used as tools by ancient Greek women to spur the men of their families to revenge when foul play was suspected, and among the laws of Solon that I mentioned were statutes regarding not lamenting another dead person at somebody else's funeral, suggesting that this had become a major issue by Solon's time. We actually have historical accounts of revenge killing and punishment either before a funeral or in front of a tomb, including one from Alexander the Great's life, suggesting that the practice continued well into the classical and Hellenistic eras. Thereby, Hughes proposes, given the constant references to rage and the centrality of rage to the plot of the Iliad and Achilles' character generally, it seems more likely that Homer dramatized two separate rituals and combined them rather than endorsed a human sacrifice at a funeral. 
From the other evidence we'll see in myth and in future videos on how ancient Greek historians talked about human sacrifice, this seems also far more likely to me as well. Ah, but in Euripides, the Trojan women in Hecuba, we have Achilles' ghost demanding Polyxena as a sacrifice for the Greeks to receive fair winds in order to get home from Troy, just like Iphigenia, who we'll talk about in part two. But that's exactly the point, as Hughes points out. There are older versions of the myth where Polyxena dies of wounds inflicted by Odysseus and is buried with Achilles later. Euripides may describe her blood as a drink offering for Achilles, however, Hecuba also speculates that Polyxena's sacrifice is demanded of him as an act of revenge in the same play, which fits more with the character of Achilles as portrayed in the epics. And as we'll see in future videos, there's little to no evidence of Greek funerary customs involving the sacrifice of humans to the dead or to the gods, but there's a lot of evidence of tragedians making philosophical arguments by perverting ritual norms on stage to provoke a disgusted reaction. In this case, as Charles Seagal points out in a paper on the play Hecuba, it's meant to symbolize the brutalization and non-consensual violation of women that occurs during wartime. The descriptions of death are notably erotic, and the chorus later compares the sacrifice to non-consensual assault at the end of the play. The sacrifice is meant to disgust the viewer, not promote any positive view of war, death, or human sacrifice. If anything, the disgust reaction expected of the audience regarding human sacrifice is specifically invoked in Hecuba to cause said audience audience to view war in a different light, considering, perhaps for the first time, the suffering of women as fully human victims of war instead of objects counted among its spoils. Motifs of sexual slavery and non-consent are found all throughout the play, and the paper itself explores these in far greater detail than I can at the moment, though if you'd really like me to get into tropes in Greek tragedy in a future video, let me know down in the comments when you finish this one. On to Lycurgus's Against Leocrates and the mythic sacrifice of Eumolpus' daughter, also dramatized by Euripides, who is heavily quoted in this passage, though the play in which this is done is otherwise lost except for fragments referenced by other writers. The context for this reference regards a trial against Leocrates in which Lycurgus accuses him of treason for leaving Athens and traveling to Rhodes and Megara, following a decree that no citizen would be allowed to travel for any purpose or to move their wives and kids. Leocrates claims he left for commerce and Lycurgos uses a number of mythic and supposedly historical examples to make the case as to why that isn't sufficient justification to break the laws of the city-state, including this passage on the myth of Eumolpus' daughters. The tradition is that Eumolpus, the son of Poseidon and Chione, came with the Thracians to claim this country during the reign of Erecteus, who was married to Praxitea, the daughter of Cephisus. As a large army was about to invade their country, he came to Delphi and asked the god by what means he could assure a victory over the enemy. The god God's answer was that if he sacrificed his daughter before the two sides engaged, he would defeat the enemy and submitting to the god, he did this and drove the invaders from the country. You must hear the iambic lines, gentlemen of the jury, which in the play are spoken by the mother of the girl. You will find in them a greatness of spirit and nobility worthy of Athens and a daughter of Cephisus. He wins men's hearts who with a ready hand confers his favors, he who in the doing delays and his falters is less generous. But I consent to give my child to die for many reasons. First, there there is no state. I count more worthy to accept my gift than Athens, peopled by no alien race, for we are of the soil, while other towns, formed as by hazard in a game of draughts, take their inhabitants from diverse places. He who adopts a city, having left some other town, resembles a bad peg fixed into wood of better quality, a citizen in name but not fact, and secondly, it is that we may guard our country and the altars of the gods that we get children for ourselves at all. The city, though it bears a single name, holds many people in it. Should I then destroy all of these when it is in my power? to give one girl to die on their behalf, the mere ability to count and tell the greater from the less convinces me that this turn, the ruin of one person's home, is of less consequence and brings less grief than would result if the whole city fell. If I had sons at home instead of girls, when hostile flames beset the city's walls, should I not send them forth into the fight? Though fearing for them, may my children then fight also, vie with the men, and not become mere shapes of vanity within the state. And yet, when mothers send their sons to war with tears, they often daunt them as they leave. I hate women who, above all else, prefer their sons to live and put this thought before honor, urging cowardice. But if they fall in battle, they obtain a common grave and glory which they share with many others, whereas she, my child, by dying for the city, will attain a garland destined solely for herself. And she will save her mother and you too, both her sisters. Is it right to scorn honors like these? Except in nature's way, this girl whom I shall give for sacrifice to save a native land that is not my own. And if the city falls, what further chance shall I have left me to enjoy my child? So far as this rests with me, all shall be saved. Let others rule in Athens. I will be her savior. And without my wishes,
which no man shall harm what most concerns our common good. The ancient laws our fathers handed down. Yomopos and his slavish Thracian train shall set no trident in our midst or deck round with garlands, where the olive tree and Gordon's golden hand have been revered. Nor shall Athena be meet with other scorn. Come, citizens, and use my travail's fruit to save yourselves and conquer, knowing well that I could never hesitate to save the city for the sake of a poor one's life. My country, where the love of all of your sons is great as mine, you could not suffer ill, and we, possessing you, would live secure. That seems like a glowing review of human sacrifice yet again from Euripides and Lycurgos, right? Not so fast. Hughes proposes that Lycurgos is using the story to create a gender role reversal of men and women, as all stories of this type were said to occur in mythic times and have zero archaeological evidence backing them. Besides, some of the stories of this sort were providing the origins for ritual customs or festivals, stories where women willingly sacrifice daughters or themselves for the cause, including the related myth of the daughters of Geikrop sending their own lives for Greek troops, challenged the men of Greece to show a similar level of devotion and royalty to their city-state. Where these mythical virgins were willing to lay down their lives for the success of a military campaign to end the plague or otherwise benefit the whole, so too the men are challenged, or in the case of Lycurgos and his attacks on the loyalty of Leocrates, repudiated for their refusal to display the same level of self-sacrifice for the collective. Euripides uses nearly every example of self-unaliving and human sacrifice to display the tragic results of loyalty to the city state by perverting ritual customs to shock and awe the audiences of his tragedies. All of them take place during a mythic history and present a similar challenge to the masculine identity of modern Greeks and to challenge the necessity of the brutality of brutally assaulting or otherwise harming women during wartime. His tragedies actively assault the narratives that position suffering as a purely noble endeavor when it regards the city state. Though it's clear here that Lycurgos didn't quite get the memo and was only interested in the ideas of loyalty he saw on the surface. Well, maybe with the exception of Euripides' take on the stories of the House of Atreus, which we'll cover in the next section, but his take on those is actually even more radical in some ways than Esculos, and nothing about human sacrifice to the gods is portrayed in a remotely positive light there. It's pretty clear that these stories exist to make damn sure the ancients knew that human sacrifice was not acceptable and to make other things less acceptable by association. It's almost like it's possible for a metaphor to be used in multiple multifaceted ways that are best understood through the lens of the ancient culture that produced them and not lumped together as evidence for earlier beliefs by enterprising scholars looking for tenure, but that might just be my layman's bias showing. Speaking of lumping stories together, there are a number of ideological tales that document the supposed ancient origins of practice contemporaneous to those writing about them that involve human sacrifice as well. The most well-known of which has to do with a joint festival of Artemis and Dionysos at Patre, both of which are interestingly the supposed recipients of most mythical human sacrifices. The story is told by Pausanias as follows. It's another long passage, but trust me, it's worth getting all the way through it. Between the Temple of Lafria and the altar stands the tomb of Eurypylos. Who he was and for what reason he came to this land, I shall set forth presently. But I first must describe the condition of affairs that was at his arrival. The Ionians who lived in Aroe, Anthea, and Mesates had in common a precinct and a temple of Artemis, surnamed Triclaria. And in her honors, the Ionians used to celebrate every year a festival and an all-night vigil. The priesthood of the goddess was held by a maiden until the time came for her to be sent to a husband. Now, the story is that once upon a time, it happened that the priestess of the goddess was Cometo, a most beautiful maiden, who had a lover called Melanipos, who was far better and handsomer than his fellows. When Melanipos had won the love of the maiden, he asked the father for his daughter's hand. It is somehow a characteristic of old age to oppose the young in most things, and especially it is insensible to the desires of lovers. So Melanipos found it, though he and Cometo were eager to wed. He met with nothing but harshness from both his parents and from those of his lover. The history of Melanipos, like many others, proved that love is apt to both break the laws of men and to desecrate the worship of the gods, seeing that this pair had their fill of passion of love in the sanctuary of Artemis. And hereafter, also, were they to use the sanctuary as a bridal chamber. Forthwith, the wrath of Artemis began to destroy the inhabitants. The earth yielded no harvest, and strange diseases occurred of an unusually fatal character. When they appealed to the oracle at Delphi, the Pythian priestess accused Melanipos and Cometho. The oracle ordered that they themselves should be sacrificed to Artemis, and that every year a sacrifice should be made to the goddess of the fairest youth and the fairest maiden. Because of this sacrifice, the river flowing by the sanctuary of Tricleria was called Emelikos. Previously, the river had no name. 
The innocent youths and maidens who perished because of Melanipos and Cometho suffered a piteous fate, as did their relatives, but the pair, I hold, were exempt from suffering, for the only thing that is worth one man's life is to be successful in love. The sacrifice to Artemis of human beings is said to have ceased in this way. An oracle that had been given from Delphi to the Patrians even before this, to the effect that a strange king would come to the land, bringing with him a strange divinity, and that this king would put an end to the sacrifice of Triclaria. When Troy was captured and the Greeks divided the spoils, Eurypylos, the son of Eumenon, got a chest. In it was an image of Dionysos, the work they say of Hephaestos, as given as a gift by Zeus to Dardanus. He goes into another story regarding the renaming of the river to Melikos. Then later he tells us that during the evening of the festival, now this is a privilege that the knight has received, and there go down to the river Melikos a certain number of native children, wearing on their heads garlands of corn ears. It was in this way that they used to array of old those whom were led to be sacrificed to Artemis. What's interesting here is the initiatory nature of a ritual of this kind. These are young kids on the cusp of becoming adults. The words used here are paides and parthenoi, or young boys and unmarried women. They leave the city, a rite of separation, bathe in the river to purify themselves, and return crowned to adulthood. This is obviously a part of many larger rites surrounding the festival, but the idea of death and rebirth as part of an initiation ritual is hardly unfamiliar even to modern people. There are similar motifs in many of the explanatory myths for other festivals involving young people in some way being sacrificed to either gods or monsters, so I won't get into every single example here. If you're interested in the topic, Human Sacrifice in Ancient Greece by Dennis D. Hughes covers it in far more depth than I could ever aspire to. That said, if we really want to get into the potential pitfalls of even considering human blood offerings or human sacrifices, we need to look no further than the series of tales that constitute the fall of the House of Atreus. Part 2. The Fall of the House of Atreus Oh boy, where to start with this one? The majority of the best-known mythic tales regarding human sacrifice are all said to be descended from one singular, rather cursed family, the House of Atreus, significant members of which include the ill-fated Atreus, Agamemnon, and Iphigenia, as well as Orestes, who all descend from the poor Pelops, who in turn was descended from the eternally punished Tantalos. That's a lot of begotten buys, so let's get into the factors that appear to play a role in the fall of this once noble house favored by the gods. As per usual, the problem started at the very roots of the family tree, with the impious Tantalos. It is seemly for a man to speak well of the gods, for the blame is less that way. Son of Tantalos, I will speak of you, contrary to the earlier stories. When your father invited the gods to a well-ordered banquet at his own Sepulos, in return for the meals he had enjoyed, then it was that the god of the splendid trident seized you, his mind overcome with desire, and carried you away on the team of golden horses to the highest home of widely honored Zeus, to which, at a to later time, Ganymede also, to perform the same service for Zeus. But when you disappeared and people did not bring you back to your mother for all their searching, right away some envious neighbor whispered that they cut you limb from limb with a knife into the water's roiling boil over a fire and among the tables of the last course they divided and ate your flesh. For me it is impossible to call one of the blessed gods a glutton. I stand back from it. Often the lot of evil speakers is profitlessness. If indeed the Watchers of Olympus ever honored a mortal man, that man was Tantalos. But he was not able to digest his great prosperity, and for his greed he gained overpowering ruin, for which the father hung over him a mighty stone. Always longing to cast it away from over his head, he wanders far from the joy of festivity. He has the helpless life of never-ending labor, a fourth toil after three others, because he stole from the gods nectar and ambrosia, with which they had made him immortal, and gave them to his drinking companions. If any man expects that which he does, escapes the notice of a god, he is wrong. Because of that, the immortals sent the son of Dantelos back again to the swift doomed race of men. Pindar's comment here about Pelops getting cooked and served to the gods and these so-called rumors are a direct reference to the other versions of the story circulating, likely in his time, but also by other authors, that Dantelos cooked his own son to serve to the gods at a banquet. The gods, being gods, notice what happened with the potential exception according to some version of the story of Demeter, who was still suffering from grief about losing Persephone. Pelops was restored to life in the cauldron of Clotho, one of the Morai, or the Fates, according to several later sources. Pelops becomes even more 
significant in her story, as according to the Iliad, he is the father of Atreus, from whom our cursed Agamemnon is descended. Nine heralds with shouting sought to restrain them. If so be, they might refrain from uproar and give ear to the kings, nurtured of Zeus. Hardly at last were the people made to sit and were stayed in their places, ceasing from their clamor. And among them, the Lord Agamemnon rose, bearing in his hands the scepter with which Hephaestus had wrought with toil. Hephaestus gave it to King Zeus, son of Kronos, and Zeus gave it to the messenger Argephontes, and Hermes the Lord gave it to Pelops, driver of horses, and Pelops in turn gave it to Atreus, shepherd of the host, and Atreus at his death left it to Thyestes, rich in flocks, and Thyestes again left it to Agamemnon to bear so that he might be the lord of the many isles of all of Argos. This passage is important as it describes the cycle of succession from Pelops to his son Atreus to his brother Thyestes to Atreus' son Agamemnon, though according to Aeschylus, Atreus fathered Pleisthenes, who then fathered Agamemnon. On the topic of the brothers, Thyestes and Atreus, however, the cursing of the family line of Tantalos continues. We've lost Euripides' play dramatizing the story, however, many later mythographers, including Prutarch, documented the story as referenced by other writers earlier than they. Pelops adopted a son and treated him as his own, which drove his wife mad with jealousy and concern for her direct sons regarding the line of succession. Pelops, the son of Tantalos and Yoranasa, married Hippodema and begot Atreus and Thyestes. But by the nymph Danes, he had Chrysippus, whom he loved more more than his legitimate sons. But Laos, the Theban, conceived a desire for him and carried him off. And although he was arrested by Theestes and Atreus, he obtained mercy from Pelops because of his love. But Hippodema tried to persuade Atreus and Theestes to deal away with Chrysippus, since she knew that he would become a contestant for the kingship. But when they refused, she stained her hands with pollution. For at the dead of night, when Laos was asleep, she drew his sword, wounding Chrysippus, and fixed the sword in his body. Laos was suspected of this because of the sword, but was saved by Chrysippus, who though half dead, acknowledged the truth. Pelops buried Chrysippus and banished Hippodamia. So, according to other versions of the story, which we have now lost, Atreus and Thyestes actually took part in the events of this story. The Curse of the Atreidae continues in a play in the Hellenistic era by Seneca the Younger, Thyestes. In it, Atreus is driven mad because he claims that his wife and allotment has been stolen by his brother and concocts a plan, with Tantalos himself being sent by the Furies to put madness in the hearts of the descendants due to rage fermented by centuries of suffering under the punishments of Zeus. Asculos also mentions this curse and a set of events in Agamemnon, though only briefly at the end, so I'd like to go over it in a bit more detail here. Atreus drags the sons of Thyestes to the altar, as many of the ancients would with any other meat they intended to feast on, which horrifies the messenger recounting the tale in the story even more. When to this place, maddened Atreus came, dragging his brother's sons, the altars were decked, but who would worthily describe the deed? Behind their backs, he fetters the use's princely hands with their sad brows and binds with purple fillets. Nothing is lacking, neither incense nor sacrificial wine. The knife, the salted meal to sprinkle on the victims, the accustomed ritual is all preserved, lest so great a crime not be duly wrought. Himself is priest, himself with baleful prayer chants the death song with boisterous utterance. Himself stands by the altar, himself handles those doomed to death, sets them in order, and lays his hand upon the knife. Himself attends to all, no part of the sacred rite is left undone. The grove begins to tremble, the whole palace sways with the quaking earth, uncertain whether to fling its ponderous map and seems to waver. From the left quarter of the sky rushes a star dragging a murky trail. The wine poured upon the fire changes from wine and flows as flood. From the king's head falls the crown twice and again, and the ivory statues in the temples weep. Yeah, it's pretty clear the gods are not accepting this sacrifice in any way. Earlier in the story, Atreus banishes the goddess Eusebia and the very concept of piety from his mind while formulating the plan under the influence of Tantalos. Seneca portrays these scenes with a detailed sadistic brutality that showcases the utter disgust that the audience is meant to feel about the entire act. There is nothing positive in the way this is seen. It is meant to evoke revulsion, especially when the sacrificial act is also tied to the act of feasting, one of the most sacred rites in ancient Greece and Rome, in which the gods were given libations before the symposium or the gathering begins and hymns were sung. But let's get back to Agamemnon, Atreus' either son or grandson, depending on which version of the story you're reading. In the Iliad, we find out that Agamemnon is the father of Iphigenia. 
And if we return to Achaea and Argos, the richest of the lands, he shall be my son, and I will honor him even as Orestes that is reared in all abundance, my son well behaved. Three daughters I have in my well-builded hall, Chrysothemos, Laodice, and Iphigenia. Of these, let him lead to the house of Peleus, the one which he will, without gifts of wooing, and I shall furthermore give a dower full of rich, such as no man ever yet gave with his daughter. This brings us to the most famous mythic tale of human sacrifice from ancient Greece the sacrifice of Iphigenia to Artemis. According to the oldest fragments we have, preserved in the commentaries by later authors, Agamemnon slayed a deer and bragged that he was a better hunter than Artemis, who was, of course, angered by the hubris. She stayed the winds and refused to let the armies read by Agamemnon reach Troy. Agamemnon goes to Calgas and is told that he has to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia to soothe the anger of the goddess. In Aeschylus' Agamemnon, we get a deeper look at this story and the brief allusions in Homer, so casing the reasoning the king used for following through. Then the elder king spoke and said, it is a hard fate to refuse obedience and hard if I must slay my child, the glory of my home and at the altar side stain a father's hand with stream of virgin's blood. Which of these courses is not also filled with evil? How can I become a deserter to my fleet and fail my allies in arms? For that they should with all to impassioned passion crave a human sacrifice to lull the winds, even a virgin's blood stands within their right, may all be for the best. But when he had donned the of necessity with veering mind impious holy unsanctified from that moment he changed his intention and began to conceive of the deed of utmost audacity for wretched delusion counselor of ill primal source of woe which makes mortals bold so he hardened his heart to sacrifice his daughter that he might further a war wage to avenge a woman and as an offering for the voyage of a fleet in many versions of the story artemis spirits iphigenia away to Torica. but wait you might think she does grant the favorable winds for the offerings that means it was accepted? Not so fast. If you remember the prayer from Solon to the Maasai in my first God profile on them, you might recall the bit about Zeus being patient and things that appear to be blessings later turning out to be curses in disguise, as the scale of justice will always be tipped by him in the end. His wife, Clytemnestra, goes mad with grief when she realizes that Agamemnon, who had told her he was going to marry Iphigenia off to Achilles, had deceived her and in fact had murdered her daughter. She plots against her husband with a lover she takes while Agamemnon is at war and kills him herself, which is also recounted in the Odyssey by Agamemnon's ghost, though without mention of the murder of Iphigenia. After the deed is done, the Koros tells us that a new murder continues the curse upon the house of Atreus. Reproach thus meets reproach in turn, hard is the struggle to decide. The spoiler is despoiled, the slayer pays penalty, yet while Zeus remains on the throne, it remains true to him who does it, it shall be done, for it is law. Who can cast out from the house the seed of this curse? The race is bound fast in calamity. This is because the actions of his mother send Orestes into a blood rage and drive him to enact revenge in the next couple stories. In the second and third entries in Aeschylus's Oresteia trilogy, we get the tale of Orestes, the tale of matricide, revenge, and eventually absolution. We'll start with Libation Bearers, which begins sometime after the events in Agamemnon. Apollon orders Orestes to avenge his father's murder, and he meets up with his sister Electra in his father's tomb to enact vengeance at the order of the gods. They plot together, ultimately bringing about the end of Clytemnestra, who curses Orestes as her life is ended. Orestes, I judge you the victor, you advise me well. To Clytemnestra, come this way, I mean to kill you by his very side, for while he lived, you thought him better than my father. Sleep with him in death, since you love him, but hate the man you are bound to love. Clytemnestra, it was I who nourished you, and with you I would grow old. Orestes, what? Murder my father, and then make your home with me? Clytemnestra, fate, my child, must share the blame for this. Orestes, as fate now brings this destiny to pass, Clytemnestra, have you no regard for a Karen's curse, my son? Orestes, you brought me to birth and then you cast me out to misery. This story gets told differently here, depending on the altar telling the tale. Euripides has Orestes fleeing to Torica, where his sister Iphigenia is positioned as the high priestess of Arptemis and tells him that she is to sacrifice all Greeks to the goddess there. Though it's revealed later that she is unpolluted and therefore has never actually wielded the knife herself for this task. Athena later drives Orestes to Torica to steal a sacred statue of Artemis, reuniting the two, then escape together under the guise of purifying Orestes for the sacrifice, as he's polluted to do the blood guilt of murdering his father under Apollon's orders. The reunion of the two serves as recompense enough for the Furies in his version, who consider the curse finally closed at that point. Aeschylus, on the other hand, has Apollon sending Orestes to Athena initially in the third play of the trilogy, Eumenides. 
Apollon assigns Hermes to watch over Orestes when Orestes appeals to him following the curse, which sets the Furies after him, tormenting him with urges towards unaliving himself. No, I will not abandon you. Your guardian to the end, close by your side or far removed, I will not be gentle to your enemies. So now you see these mad women overcome, these loathsome maidens have fallen asleep, old women, ancient children with whom no god or man or beast ever mingles. They were even born for evil, since they live in evil gloom and in Tartaros under the earth, creatures hateful to men and to the Olympian gods. Nevertheless, escape and do not be cowardly, for as you go always over the earth that wanderers tread, they will end you on, even across the wide mainland, beyond the sea and the island cities. Do not grow weary too soon, brooding on this labor, but when you have come to Pallas' city, sit down and hold in your arms her ancient image. And then, and there, with judges of your case and speeches of persuasive charm, we shall find means to release you completely from your labors, for I have persuaded you to take your mother's life. Apollon takes responsibility for sending Orestes to avenge his mother and purge the blood guilt of his family line and thereby sets into motion events that allow for the absolution with the Furies. As Apollon is a purifying god generally and madness is a tool for purification, as I'll eventually cover in my Mania series, this makes a lot of sense. Even though it looks like the gods sanctioning human sacrifice, it's actually kind of the opposite. There was a complex system of revenge, repayment, justice, and honors in ancient Greece on the whole, and Apollon was facilitating justice in this purview by replacing the rage into Orestes' heart to seek justice on behalf of his fallen father. Blood guilt is serious business among the gods. The views expressed by Apollon here mark a major division in the mind of ancient Greece, the divide between revenge and justice, as personified by the Furies and Apollon respectively. Apollon thinks the Furies are reprehensible because they are said to pay no mind to justice and their revenge when called upon in a curse, whereas he sees the justice of a life for a life in the case of Clytemnestra as sufficient to end the blood guilt curse upon the house of Atreus. The Furies, when they wake up, on the other hand, think Apollon is out to steal their time, or areas of influence in the world. This actually gets explored directly later when Apollon and the Furies argue regarding the difference between revenge and justice. Apollon believes that the Furies are hypocrites for not punishing Clytemnestra for killing her husband, where the Furies feel Apollon defiled his own temple by helping a murderer of the worst kind, as Clytemnestra's crime didn't take the life of someone of her own flesh and blood. Apollon sees this as an affront to the sacred bonds of marriage and yet again indicates his disgust for the rigid views of the Furies, who then go and pursue Orestes. Orestes makes it to Athena's altar and falls before her as a suppliant after the Furies make a display of their power. She insists on hearing both sides of the story, and Orestes explains that he doesn't actually need to be purged of his blood guilt, as he was told by a god directly to do as he did, and that it was in the pursuit of justice. As a suppliant of Athena, she is bound to treat him with mercy and thereby creates a middle ground solution, appointing the finest men of Athens to judge Orestes in a trial. They eventually find him innocent due to Apollon's orders in a split vote, but the Furies are, well, Furious. Athena, being a goddess of both diplomacy and justice, manages to broker a deal that satisfies them where they will be honored in every house in Athens and her main temple for all times as the Eumenides, the kindly goddesses. Remember when I talked about revenge killing and the negative cycles of reciprocity that could happen in Greece? The story was clearly inspired by some actual historical events surrounding revenge killing, and even though Orestes was exonerated in Aeschylus' version of the tale, this was done by a court and not just the decrees of the gods. Not only was human sacrifice an aberration, but Aeschylus puts revenge killing on par with it here, encouraging those viewing his plays to defer to the laws of the city-state as being of the gods as the cycles of revenge killing promoted by the Furies. It's as much political commentary as myth, though it's layered in disgust at the reciprocal violence and the perversion of actual rights the Greeks would have been intimately familiar with. That was a lot to get through, but you can clearly see how blood guilt was seen by the Greeks from the earliest times well into the Hellenistic era. Sacrificing a human to the gods was polluting because the blood clung to your hands, disgusting the gods and potentially sending the Furies after you if your victim saw fit to curse you. Clytemnestra's ghost even urged the Furies on at one point during the play, citing offerings she'd given during her life. Even with Apollon's help, a balance had to be struck to purge the blood guilt of Orestes' line and finally end the curse. This all clearly started with Tantalos, according to some later authors and Greek historians in antiquity. The fact that the punishment made its way through Tantalos, took Pelops' adopted son, and sent his blood sons Atreus and Theastes against each other, corrupted Atreus' son Agamemnon into killing his daughter, and then eventually killed by his wife in retribution, and finally only ended with Apollon specifically purifying blood guilt through Orestes, should tell you something. The moral of all of these stories is clear. Don't sacrifice people to the gods, especially not your family.
Cannibalism is also right out, and the aspect of feasting found in most of the earliest examples showcases how important the consumption of meat and libations during the feast were in ancient home sacrifices when homes had enough money to sacrifice and feast. It's made clear in every example that the human blood spilled defiled the altar, as was said directly in Thyestes and Curses the Family Line, as repeatedly stated throughout the Oresteia. Ancient authors returned to these stories again and again to examine the nuances of justice, revenge, fate, pollution, and purity. Never once in any of the stories is a direct sacrifice of a human sanctioned by a god. Justice killing is even taken from the hands of the gods and given to human courts at the end of Eumenides. I hope you can see, even from the limited examples that I've given, that the majority of the depictions of human sacrifice and murder in ancient myth were clearly either subversive, in the case of tragedy, or symbolic, in the case of many of the myths covered in part one. These mythic examples aren't all we have, though. You see, the historians of antiquity documented supposed cases of human sacrifice as well. Unfortunately, this exploration of mythic sacrifice ran really long, so we're gonna have to examine those in the next video. Make sure to wrap the subscribe button in the fat of the slaughtered like and ring the notification bell to the tune of your funerary laments so you don't miss it. Special thanks also to my patrons, who heavily encouraged me to the deep dive into this topic and turn this into a series when I realized just how deep the rabbit hole went on the mythic end. You all have always had my back and urged me on when I really wanted to explore topics like this, even the controversial ones, and I'll be forever ever grateful for the support. May the cycles of reciprocity between us ever remain positive. And remember, we're stronger together.